So for those on Facebook, we've started streaming live. So a warm welcome to everybody who's tuning in <laughs> on social media. It's amazing how far these uh, retreats can reach sometimes. So we're going to formally introduce the retreat for our retreatants here very soon. And for everyone who is here on retreat, it's, uh, it's a protected space. Everybody's full time. So, uh, and only questions from this group will be taken, not from Facebook, I'm afraid. You have to join the retreat for that <laughs> because we want to give our retreatants a really uh, a deep and hopefully profound experience where they can ask their questions in a safe space. Fabrizio is saying hello to you, Ajahn Brumali. Fabrizio has been in Bodignano a couple of times from Italy. Yeah, yeah hello Fabrizio. Hello. Where are you? <laughs> Trying to find you there, but yeah. <laughs> hi anyway. We have two, two pages of people, two screens. <clears throat> yeah, Fabrizio's not got his video on, which is fine. You don't need to. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to my co-host Leone to start with the introductions so we can get off to a prompt start. Yes, thank you, Venerable. Um, I would just like to extend a very warm welcome to the special eight-day retreat with Ajahn Brahmali and with Venerable Chanda um, and to introduce you to the co-host team and to Venerable Chanda. My name is Leone. I'm one of the co-hosts on this retreat together with Mel. Derek, Rennie, and with Matthias. Um, Mel and Rennie are responsible for recording the sessions and live streaming them to Facebook. Matthias will be present for the optional silent group meditation sessions in the late afternoon of each day from 5.15 to 6 p.m. And Derek and I will be responsible for collecting all of your questions during the Q&A periods and passing them along to Venerable Chanda. We will take turns doing this, so we will let you know whom to send your questions to. Um, I will also be available throughout the retreat for any questions you may have outside of, outside of the Q&A sessions. Um, this may be anything related to the course of the retreat or even to technical problems, and I will do my best to help you with anything. Um, that being said, to support the community to stay in noble silence, we ask you not to use the chat box during teaching ses sessions, except um, when you're invited to submit questions for the Q&A sessions, or if you require support, as I just said, but then please send a, a private message to me directly. Um, throughout the retreat, Zoom will be set to speak of you, which means your video will not be recorded. Um, and the retreat is organized by Venerable Chanda and by the bookings volunteer Annie on behalf of the Anukampa Bikuni project. And just a few words about Ven Venerable Chanda, even though I know, I'm sure all of you know her quite well already. Um, Venerable Chanda is currently Britain's only resident Bikuni, meaning fully ordained Buddhist nun in the Theravada tradition. She came into contact with the Buddhist teachings in India at the age of 20 through the Vipassana tradition as taught by S.N. Goenka. Uh, and during her first retreat, she decided to devote the rest of her life to ending suffering through practicing the Buddhist teachings. In October 2015, Ajahn Brahm asked Venerable Chanda to take steps to, towards establishing the first Bhikkhuni monastery with a focus on early Buddhism in the UK to increase equality in practice and ordination opportunities for women. To this end, Venerable Chanda is now leading the Anukampa Bikuni project. Presently residing in Oxford, Venerable Chanda is tirelessly engaged in growing a spiritual community in her homeland through her popular weekly teaching sessions on Zoom. All of these teaching sessions are made available on the Anukampa Bikuni YouTube channel. Venerable Chanda is known for her very approachable and friendly teaching style and for being a compassionate and accessible Dharma teacher and spiritual friend. All donations from this retreat will be in support of the Anukampa Bikuni project's aim of a future Bikuni monastery. Um, and before I pass over to Venerable Chanda, I would like to just share a few retreat guidelines with you. Um, you are encouraged to carve out a space in your home that you dedicate to silent practice ideally using the same place for the duration of the retreat. Noble silence is encouraged throughout the day retreat. This includes silence of body and speech. 
and also abstaining from the use of electronic devices, including your mobile phones. Um, we also ask you to join the sessions with the name you registered with and to join early so that we as co-hosts have the time to let you into the Zoom room. And the room will be open 15 minutes before we start to give you the chance to join in good time before we begin. So this is all from me. I wish you all a very wonderful retreat um, and I'm going to pass over to Venerable Chanda now to speak about the schedule and also to introduce Ajahn Brahmali. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leonie. And uh, just before this uh, retreat started, before um, Leonie spoke, we were talking with Ajahn Brahmali and uh, we said, so Leonie will introduce me, then I'll introduce Ajahn Brahmali. And Ajahn Brahmali said, and then I'll introduce the Buddha. <laughs> so bit by bit, we're getting closer <laughs> to introducing the Buddha. <laughs> and of course, you know, hopefully the Sangha is that representative, isn't it, of the Buddha's teachings. So this is very wonderful. So first of all, before I do introduce Ajahn Bramali, just a few words about the schedule. Um, I think you all have it written down and also for the sake of those listening in um, via Facebook. So every morning we'll start with a session from 8.30 till 10 a.m. And that will include some meditation led by Ajahn Bramali and a Dhamma talk. And then there'll be a, a period of about two hours where you may, if you're on eight precepts, wish to prepare your lunch and have your lunch, depending on the time zone you're in. Um, and I think at this particular time, because it's the summertime, you can eat up until about 1 p.m. in your local time zone. So there's a little bit of leeway there. And then at 12 p.m., that's the UK time again, we'll have another um, teaching session where Ajahn Bramali will look through some suttas and there'll be an opportunity to ask him some questions until about 1.30, again, British time. And then there's a long practice period, a personal practice period in the afternoon for you to apply these teachings in the ways that feel most uh, nourishing, most wholesome, most supportive for you. And there's also an opportunity, as, as Leonie said, to come together as a group and do about 45 minutes silent meditation together. So Matthias has very kindly offered to open up the Zoom room, so the same link at about five o'clock. And we do ask that if you want to join that, you do arrive before 5.15, because Matthias is actually on retreat. He's not co-hosting for this retreat. So the idea is that he will start to meditate himself at 5.15 till six. So he doesn't want to be opening his eyes, or I don't want him to be opening his eyes and you know having to manage the room. So if you can please come early for that, and it'll just be a silent sitting, but sometimes people find it supportive to um, know that there are other people practicing with them together. Uh, many of you have said to me during our sessions that it feels as though it augments the practice. Um, it's something quite magical, I feel, because even though we're on the Zoom set setting, Still, there's that sort of energy that we can share that's very supportive in the meditation practice. So that will start, he'll open the meeting at five and at six o'clock he'll just ring a little bell, but there'll be no speaking at all. So please don't use the chat box or anything, just come along to meditate. You can turn your video off also if you wish. And then at 7.30, um, I'll be giving a reflection on various themes and a guided meditation and another opportunity for you to ask questions or um, share whatever you wish about the retreat and how it's going yeah and all the questions just to clarify um, should be sent to Derek so you'll notice that he has the name Q&A Derek so his role is even more important than his identity for this eight days um, so if you can send everything to him that really helps me as well not to you know, get too many messages and, and my mind is still liable to be distracted if I see messages in the chat box. So he will organize all that for us. Wonderful. So now it gets on to introducing Ajahn Brahmali. So a very, very warm welcome again, Ajahn Brahmali, who's zooming in all the way from Perth <laughs> in Serpentine at Bodhinyana Monastery. So I wanted to just read a little biography for those who are less familiar with Ajahn Brahmali and his uh, path into the practice. So born in Norway in 1964, Ajahn Brahmali felt a strong calling to Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s after a visit to Japan. 
He completed master's degrees in engineering and finance before renouncing the world of industry and commerce to ordain. He began his monastic training as an Anagadika in England at Amravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. In 94, after hearing a teaching by Ajahn Brahm, he moved to Australia to train at Bodhinyana Monastery, where he now resides. He took full ordination as a bhikkhu, a fully ordained monk, with Ajahn Brahm as preceptor in 1996, and has now been a monk for at least 25 years. So get the maths right there. Apart from having been responsible for the building work at Bodhinyana Monastery, Ajahn Brahmali teaches the Vinaya, the monastic training precepts, and also Pali, the language of the early Buddhist texts. A strong advocate for gender equity in Buddhism, he also played an instrumental role in the first Theravada bhikkhuni ordinations in Perth in 2009. Quietly in the background, but very important role. Ajahn Brahmali is a powerfully effective teacher of meditation who draws his inspiration primarily from the early Buddhist texts and as well, of course, from Ajahn Brahm. His lucidly inspiring talks bring the Buddha's teachings alive and are very popular downloads on the BSWA YouTube channel, making him a much respected and sought after teacher internationally. So we're very, very grateful and privileged to have you here with us for a full eight days Ajahn Brahmali, and uh, we'll hand over to you to begin. And I think we're going to um, go through the refuges and precepts as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Pedro, for your kind and nice introduction. And uh, nice to see you all again. I recognize some of your faces and some of you not so sure. I've probably seen them before, but sometimes I just can't remember everyone, unfortunately. But uh, regardless, you're very welcome to be here. And I'm very glad to be able to have this opportunity because there's something about the word of the Buddha which is always inspiring. Maybe not always, because sometimes you might be in the wrong mood or whatever, but usually if you kind of come from the right place, and then very often it is very inspiring and uplifting. So it's a great to be able to share these things with you. And I look forward to this and, and hopefully we're going to have a good, nice, Eight days together, that will be marvelous. It's eight full days, when the book time, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, eight full days, right. Okay, so let's get that clarified straight away. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, we start the uh, uh, everything with giving the three refuges and the five precepts. So, so um, I suppose, how are we going to do this? Can we have, should we have a venerable chanda? Should we have one person? Uh, on your side, replying on behalf of everyone. Is that a good idea? Or uh, can do, Ajahn. Yeah, maybe Derek or someone. Uh, <laughs> Are you up for that, Derek? Sorry, I don't know how to. I don't know the words, but I can. Try. <laughs> uh, so, did you get that little um, the uh, thing that we sent you, the attachments with the precepts, or would anyone else like to volunteer? Just looking for my attachment. <laughs> you're supposed to be losing your attachment, but now you're looking for your attachment. <laughs> it's also on our website, otherwise. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry too much about the attachments there. If you if you can't find them, it's probably a good sign. So don't, don't worry too much. You, okay, so let, let's just uh, I'll just do it, and then uh, uh, we don't really have you don't really have to say anything because you just it's basically just a, a commitment to undertake the precepts. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if you say it or not, just as long as you think it in your mind and you you make the commitment, that will be good enough. Is that okay, Venerable? Should we do that way? That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so I will just uh, start, and then you can just kind of follow along with me. Yeah, I want I want pause as we usually do because uh, uh, there's no one responding, so we just uh, carry on there. So here we go. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. So now we'll do the uh, three refuges. Buddha hung, Saranang, Chami, 
Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Te Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Te Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Te Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam Te Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam Te Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam Te Sangang Saranang Gachami Ti Saranagamanang Nitang And then comes the five precepts and also the eight precepts. So I'll just do them uh, continuously all the way through. And then you just stop wherever you feel it is appropriate. Anati pata vera mani sika padang samadhyami. Adinna dana vera mani sika padang samadhyami. Kame sumi chachara slash abramacharya vera mani sika padang samadhyami. Musabada Veda Mani Sika Padang Samadhyami Sura Meraya Majja Pamadatana Veda Mani Sika Padang Samadhyami Vikala Bhujana Veda Mani Sika Padang Samadhyami Nacha Gita Vadita Visukadasana Malaganda Vilepana Dharana Mandana Vibhusvanatana Vera Mani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Maha Ucha Mahasaya Ucha Sayana Vera Mani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Emani Atta Da sika padani silena sugadiyanti silena boga sampada silena nibudenyanti tasma silang visoda. Yeah. Okay. There you are. You now all taking the precepts whether you want to or not. To. So that's it. <laughs> so uh, and uh, the idea at the very end there has this very nice verse at the end which says that uh, the um, first of all it says that. Uh, uh, sila, yeah, virtue, morality, kindness, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it leads to a sugar thing, it leads to a good destination in the future. And that is, regardless how you interpret the idea of destination, it leads to something positive in the future. Yeah? And it also says that silena uh, boga sampada, it means that uh, you have value, you have wealth uh, by way of sila. Sila is a, a real wealth for people, yeah, wealth in the sense that it gives rise to lasting happiness is the wealth of the heart rather than the external wealth. And uh, lastly, it says that it leads to nibuting, and nibuting is like the extinguishment, uh, yeah? So I don't know what you think about extinguishment, but that's where it goes anyway. So hopefully you're keen on extinguishment, uh, otherwise you might have a problem with this sila business. <laughs> so um, anyway, we can discuss those things later on, what is actually meant by some of these things. Uh, but there you are. Uh, so um, we are, we can now begin and um, I will start by giving a little bit of an overview session today and I will talk a little bit in general about meditation practice so we can get started with the meditation and all of these things. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I always love to do on these retreats uh, is to focus on, on the suttas, uh, the word of the Buddha. Uh, why? Because I think the word of the Buddha is very powerful and, and I think if we uh, use it in the right way, if we uh, reflect on it in the right way, it is extraordinarily supportive for meditation practice. Uh, and it is supportive in a couple of different ways. And I thought just very briefly, I'll talk about those different ways uh, in which it is so powerful. First of all, it is obviously very useful because the suttas give very uh, quite a bit of information about meditation practice itself. Yeah, it uh, gives a lot of detail, for example, in suttas like the 
a famous Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on the Mindfulness of Breathing. Here you find quite a bit of detail uh, about meditation practice. Then there is the Satipatthana Sutta, which also is very significant for obvious reasons uh, uh, when it comes to meditation. But really, to fully understand the full scope of how the Buddha teaches meditation, you really need to look in across the board, look at all the suttas, basically. Read all the 5,000 pages or whatever it is of suttas. And yeah, I, I don't know how many of you have done that. Maybe none of you, because not many people have read all of our suttas. But I certainly have uh, several times. Uh, and uh, when you start to know the suttas uh, well, uh, you start to be able to pick out bits and pieces yeah, from various places and bring it all together. And this is actually quite important. Sometimes people complain that the suttas, uh, the meditation instruction is not specific enough. Yeah, they say, well, where are all the links? You know, how do you go from watching the breath to feeling joy and all of this? How do you bring, how do you give rise to the joy? Uh, or how do you go from the joyful feelings to give rise to those marvelous, beautiful nimittas that you hear about quite often, especially if you listen to Ajahn Brahm. Listen to Ajahn Brahm, you hear about nimittas and jhanas all the time. Yeah? How do you go from one to the other? How do you go from the nimittas to the jhana states? And wherever you are on that path, sometimes you would like to have more information. And the way to get that, one way to get that is to read the suttas broadly, to read them with care, to pick out, to look at all the details, because sometimes individual words may have a lot of meaning in the suttas. And as you put it all together, you start to get the picture of what the Buddha was teaching. Yeah. So that is one way in which the suttas are very significant. And I hope to be able to bring out for you some of the various angles uh, uh, that you find in the suttas from various places. But there is another way, which is perhaps uh, uh, even more interesting. And that is that the suttas can actually there's a couple of more ways the suttas can inspire you yeah you read the suttas you hear the word of the buddha uh, you hear about the path to the end of suffering and the highest happiness uh, how can that not be inspired inspiring uh, how can we not be inspired inspired by that very thing that all of us actually is yearning for somewhere deep down uh, the kind of full contentment the full happiness uh, and the idea that we have as buddhists uh, we have the most astonishing teacher, the greatest spiritual genius in human recorded human history. And what a marvelous thing that is. And when you start to realize that your teacher is the greatest spiritual genius in the in human history, you start to get goosebumps. The problem is actually realizing that, understanding that that actually is the case. But once that happens, it is almost bound to give rise to some kind of joy and happiness inside. And the goosebumps that come from joy, well, that is a kind of PT, PT being one of the fundamental factors for meditation to move forward. So, um, yeah, and this is what these teachings can do precisely because you understand this is what life is all about. If there is a meaning to life, that meaning is found in these suttas. Everything else in the world starts to fade by comparison when you start to understand what these teachings are about. But there is a, a third thing that these suttas do, which is also very, very powerful and interesting. And that is that they tend to turn your mind in the right direction. They remind you of what is important in life. They help you to renounce those things that don't really matter. Yeah, all the things in the world that are uh, that basically just distract you from meditation. So they actually help you to renounce. They help you to turn the mind in the right direction towards those things that actually aid meditation practice. And we're going to be looking at quite a few of those suttas, hopefully, as we do this. Yeah, that the, the, I, these things that uh, show you uh, where to let go and how to let go of those things. Uh, and then by default, also turning your mind in the right direction as, uh, as, as that happens. Uh, and the Buddha is a master of this. Uh, yeah, and this is, uh, of course, then going to be very, very useful. So sometimes it's strange. You, you just sit there, you listen to the suttas, and you think, and you kind of, and, and you don't, not really sure, yeah, whether it's going to work or not. And then you meditate afterwards, and suddenly find yourself being so peaceful. Man. And the reason you feel peaceful is because something has sunk in a place that you hadn't expected, yeah, because you heard a teaching. Yeah? Maybe you haven't even fully comprehended what is going on, or perhaps you have fully comprehended it. Uh, 
but somehow it has hit you in a deep way here. And then you feel inspired as a consequence. You let go in the right way as a consequence. And the whole thing just unfolds uh, because of that. So this is the idea of the power of joining the suttas uh, yeah, with uh, meditation practice. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that will work for you, at least some of you. And if it doesn't work, Look fully for you, then it is at least the start, is the beginning of a path moving in the right direction. And I have always been astonished because um, if you look at the world, you always see that people take all kinds of people as their teachers. Yeah, this is my venerable so and so, I am Bhante so and so, Aya so and so, Rinpoche so and so is my teacher. But very few people take the Buddha to be their teacher. Yeah, how often do you hear people say, The Buddha is my, who's your teacher? The Buddha is my teacher. How often have you heard that? Uh, just about zero times, I, I think. Uh, unless you ask me, if you had asked me, or maybe Venerable Chanda, you would have heard that. But for most other people, maybe some of you as well, because you've been around for a while, maybe you think in that way. But it's very rare to hear that. Uh, and yet the teachings of the Buddha are much more powerful than anyone else in their directness, in their precision, in the articulateness in the, in this, the, the whole thing about this teaching is very, very powerful. Right? And sometimes you may be put off by the style, which may seem slightly artificial because it is two and a half thousand years old and all of these kind of things. Right? But once you kind of break through that barrier, you break through the, sometimes, unfortunately, the translations are often also too stilted and too intellectual to really grab the heart. But once you break through that, and you break through to the meaning behind the words, uh, they really start to speak to you in a very powerful way. Why not go to the source? Uh, why do we always kind of fiddle around on the surface? Uh, let's go directly to the source uh, and see what that can do for us. Uh, and then it can become very, I say, it can become very powerful. Uh, so that is the idea then be, be, behind this and uh, joining the suttas uh, with the meditation practice. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the title later on. Yeah, the title used initially the title was just why. <laughs> Remember Ben Mushanda? The beginning of the title was why of the Hobbit. And then we thought, okay, maybe we should add a few words. Yeah, and then it kind of evolved from there. But uh, so later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about the title why. Yeah, because it sounds maybe a bit cryptic, but actually it's a really nice title. It came from Ajahn Brahm, actually, originally, I think. Yeah. Uh, or something like that, and then Venerable Shanda, and then I sort of agreed to it because I thought it was a cool title, so we, we stuck to that. Uh, I'll talk about that later, but I think for now, because time uh, goes so fast, uh, I will just get into talking a little bit about meditation practice instead, uh, and then we can do some meditation together afterwards. So, so um, one of the, uh, uh, a, a good starting point to talk about meditation is something I have talked a little bit about recently. Uh, and uh, that was something that uh, came, happened during the rains retreat at Vodhinyana Monastery this year, yeah? And what often, very often happens is that Ajahn Brahm, he teaches everyone. Uh, and usually during the rains retreat, Ajahn Brahm will give a weekly teaching and I will also give a weekly teaching, yeah? And then Ajahn Brahm gives a teaching and nobody dares to question Ajahn Brahm. So then when it's my turn, they come to me and they say, what did Ajahn Brahm mean by this? You know, what is, what is, what is this? How are we supposed to do this? Ajahn Brahm says, just sit down and don't do anything. Just allow things to be. And then the nimittas come. But it doesn't happen for me. Why is that? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, which is fascinating. So I had to kind of explain what Ajahn Brahm means, right? As if I, 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 as if I have the, the right to do that. But I try my best anyway, just out of, you know, because it's interesting. Yeah. And um, so... One of the questions that arose, and this arises quite commonly with Ajahn Brahm, is that people say, Ajahn Brahm says, sit down, relax, don't do anything, and just sit there and keep on not doing anything until everything just happens by itself. Yeah? This is a kind of typical teaching of Ajahn Brahm. Right? And if it isn't happening, then Ajahn Brahm says, you haven't sat long enough, sit long here. Yeah? And then that's, that's pretty much, that's, sometimes that's all he says. Yeah? Sometimes he says much more, but sometimes that's all he says. And then people come and they say, I'm confused. It's not working for me. Why isn't it working for me? And that is a very interesting question. Yeah, it's a very, because if we can uncover why such a simple technique as that, why it works for someone like Adam Brahm, while it does not work for others, or maybe it works partially, it takes you 
part of the way towards the Nimitas, and maybe it takes you part of the way towards peace and happiness, but not all the way. Huh? Yeah, so if we can uncover, if we can somehow find the solution to why this is not working for the rest of us, uh, then we can maybe we can kind of, this is maybe a bit like the holy grail of meditation practice, yeah? Finding that gem, that thing, that key, which turns the lock and then opens the door to all these magnificent things that are available to us out there. Huh? So for that reason, it's a very, very interesting question here. And um, so uh, what then uh, is the answer to this question? This is what I want to talk about now. Huh? So to, to get this, the very first thing to remember huh, yeah, is that Ajahn Brahm always talks about uh, when you meditate, you have to be at ease, you have to relax, and basically you have to enjoy yourself. Huh? Yeah, and um, uh, many people, they, they think they are kind of worried about that, or maybe they think that it's going too far. If you relax too much, you just fall asleep and you have to be a bit kind of, you know, rigid to kind of keep you awake and all these kind of things. But really, the way that Ajahn Brahm teaches this is very much in line with how the Buddha teaches in the suttas. Yeah, this is one of the, this is the famous sutta, the famous uh, first teaching of the Buddha where he teaches the middle way. And the middle way is precisely about avoiding on the one hand, the torture of the body, huh? and on the other hand, the indulgence uh, in the five senses. Uh, yeah? and that is very, very similar to what Adam Brahm is talking about when he talks about relaxing. Yeah? Relaxing does not mean indulging. Yeah? It doesn't mean kind of, oh, it is so nice. This, this waterbed is the most kind of comfortable thing. Oh, so comfortable. But actually, if it's so comfortable, then probably you are already indulging a little bit. Uh, comfort means not indulgence. Uh, it means absence of pain. It means absence of tension. It means absence of stress. It means being able to be at ease, not to indulge. So this is really the first thing, and it fits almost precisely with how the Buddha is teaching. Yeah, the idea of the middle way, neither indulgence nor um, the pain of the body or the pain of the five senses. And when you think about it, this teaching is eminently sensible. And the reason why it is sensible is that meditation practice is a practice of the mind. It's the mind that we're trying to still. Then. It is the mind we were trying to, you know, hopefully down the track to get, give rise to joy. It is in the mind that we experience the nimittas, the bright lights. It's in the mind that we attain jhanas and samadhi. Everything is really a mental thing. And we know that the body gets in the way. And the body can get in the way in two different ways, either by being painful, yeah, and you'll get very distracted if the body is too painful, or if you indulge, because if you indulge, you're looking for pleasure in the body. Yeah? And in both of those cases, the mind goes out, yeah? it goes outside, instead of staying within, it goes out to the five senses. And that going out into the world, taking an interest in the five senses, well, this is precisely the problem. This is what we're trying to avoid. And that is why both discomfort and indulgence are problematic. It's interesting. I, I, I remember we had a, a couple of the bhikkhunis from Dhammasara Monastery that very often come uh, for when we do retreats at Jana Grove. And a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I did a retreat and some of the bhikkhunis were there. And she said to me after I gave a very very similar talk now because I always give the same talk, right? It's always this exact, well, exactly, but you know, around about the same thing. So, uh, and she said to me, well, it's not really a middle way at all then because we are trying to avoid the senses so we can go to the mind. Both the pain and the indulgence is really on the sensory side, and on the other side is the mind, which is the practice. Uh, yeah, what we're trying to do. Uh, that is a good point in a sense. Yeah, one way of thinking about it as is as a middle way between two extremes. Another way to think about it is that both of these extremes have to do with the body, with the five senses, with the external world. So they are, in one sense, on the same side. And we're trying to let go of that so we can go inwards instead. Yeah? So there is a two kind of slightly conflicting ways of thinking about that idea of the middle way. And then, yeah, if you're able to let go of the body like that, do that through relaxing, do that if you like through a little bit of body, uh, 
body awareness where you kind of let go of the body, you soften the body up, you're gentle with yourself. Uh, uh, then you go to the mental world, you do a similar kind of thing with the mental world as well, because the mental world is often involved still with the body and the world outside for a while. So you calm that down as well, you let go of that, uh, and then you start to feel peaceful, you start to relax, you let go of all of those problems. It's such a, an important starting point. Uh, um, so uh, that, that is the first thing, yeah? The second thing when it comes to Ajahn Brahm, yeah, and again, uh, uh, it's very, very similar to what you find in the suttas, uh, is that I have been Ajahn, around Ajahn Brahm now for, it's getting close to 28 years, gee, yeah, 20, almost 28 years, it's a, long, it's a long time, it doesn't feel like 28 years, life goes really fast, doesn't it? Zip, it's gone then. Okay, anyway, 28 years, and one of the things which is so, uh, obvious with someone like Ajahn Brahm is all the joy he has, yeah? all the happiness that he has. Uh, knowing him for 28 years, you can see it's always been there, kind of bubbling under the surface. Uh, and you know what it's like. He always likes to joke around and have a good time. And sometimes people say, oh, no, not another Ajahn Brahm joke. But really, what the things that you should think when you hear the jokes from Ajahn Brahm, you should think about the joy that actually it comes from the joy. It comes from all this joy bubbling under the surface, yeah. And for that, and the one one way that he expresses that joy is through telling jokes. Sometimes very silly jokes, but still, nevertheless, by telling jokes. And he's always been like that. You know, I often sit next to Ajahn Brahm, and he's kind of a an eternal kind of uh, bubbling of joy within, uh, not, not all the time, not 100% of the time, of course, uh, but a lot of the time that joy is there under the surface. Uh, and then you start to read the suttas again, uh, and you start to see how the Buddha teaches meditation. And this is going to be one of the main themes of this particular meditation retreat. If this was suggested by Venerable Chanda, and I'm always very happy to act on suggestions. Uh, and this is about the uh, the psychological experience of meditation, how each one of us uh, ideally experience meditation when the meditation is going right. Uh, and the way the Buddha describes this, uh, yeah, it is just so, again, it's so awesome, <laughs> you know, to use one of these modern words that everyone uses. Uh, I'm kind of the older generation. We didn't use so much the word awesome when I grew up. Actually, they started already then. That's not that. But, it's so amazing, astonishing, because uh, everything really revolves around the idea of gladness and joy and happiness and bliss. On top of that, peace, tranquility, calm. Yeah, this is the kind of the psychological experience of meditation. Uh, and I would say, if you can summarize meditation in two words, uh, yeah, it is ever more increasing depths of calm and ever more profound experiences of bliss. Yeah, so happiness and calm, bliss and peace, these two qualities growing in tandem more and more profoundly. That is very much what meditation is about. This is what you will hear from someone like Adam Brahm. It is also what you comes out very clearly from the suttas when you, when you see the suttas. So the development of the uh, joy on the Buddhist path is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and you will know this starts not in meditation, it starts outside of meditation. It has to do with how we live our lives. Yeah, You live with kindness, you live with generosity, you live with a degree of metta and compassion for all people, for all animals, for the entire world. And the more we can do that, the more we encourage joy and happiness in our daily life. And then when we eventually sit down, we do a retreat, even if you meditate in your daily life, yeah, you can, some of that comes out in that meditation. In fact, not only some of it comes out, but you can build on that to, to make it even more profound in a meditation practice. Once you start to understand this, once you understand that the absolutely critical factor of joy on the Buddhist path and happiness on the Buddhist path, it will make you far more, it will increase your ability yeah, to live a moral and kind life uh, massively. Yeah. Because once you understand this, the mindfulness will be established in the back of your mind. Yeah, The mindfulness that alerts you all the time to the significance of these things. Yeah, This is like a critical thing to make meditation work. Yeah. If you understand how critical it really is, it is like that memory will be lodged in the back of your mind. Uh, 
And then whenever you come into a situation whereby maybe you are, uh, sometimes you might be tempted to say something slightly wrong, wrong. Yeah, who isn't? Everyone isn't every now and again. Because the mindfulness is launched there very deeply inside of you, it will stop your inner tracks. It will remind you of what really matters in this world. Also, it will help you to live with more kindness. Every time you see an opportunity to live with kindness, you will take it. You will take it because the memory will come back. This really matters. This is the critical issue that will enable me to have success in my entire spiritual life, including my meditation practice. Do I really want to take a step backwards? Do I want to destroy or damage or um, you know, detract from my ability to meditate? Of course not. Every step forward matters. Yeah. And you become like obsessed with being kind. Yeah. You become attached to being kind. Before we were just talk, talking with Derek, we were just mentioning that he couldn't find his attachments, which uh, is probably a good thing if it's on the computer. <laughs> But uh, being attached to kindness is actually a marvelous thing. Yeah? Because if we don't have that little bit of attachment to kindness, uh, yeah, we're not going to be able to do it properly. So please have some attachment to kindness. Uh, the idea of you know, moving up the ladder of attachments is a very nice metaphor or simile for how attachments work. Yeah? Letting go of the bad ones, moving on to the better ones. Uh, and then you're starting, this whole thing starts to come together. Uh, so this is the second factor, yeah, which where you see in Ajahn Brahm and you start to understand the significance. I should say um, also, by the way, which I haven't really, didn't really touch on, and that is that um, in my experience, uh, Ajahn Brahm is one of the kind of supreme meditators, uh, yeah, around these days. Uh, uh, he, his depth of meditation, it's obvious. Yeah? When you know someone well, you know how they live, you know what they like, you know their integrity. This is what you discover when you live with someone for a very long time. Yeah? And uh, you, you know where people are at in their meditation practice. And he's one of these people who has really, really good meditation. Yeah? And uh, so that is one of the reasons why I obviously use him as an example in this particular case. So uh, those are the two preliminary, kind of preliminary issues, yeah? Be comfortable there. Find some joy in the meditation there. Now, um, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about, I can talk about that some other time. Let's, let's leave that out for now. But one of the, one of the things that was uh, uh, very fascinating about this question that we had during the Rains retreat, yeah? How do we do this? How can we do what Adam Brahm says? Yeah, I told them, well, I said to them, this was my answer to them. Yeah, I said, well, the reason why Ajahn Brahm is having success and you are not, I said that to that person, maybe you are not, uh, at least not in this quite the same way. Yeah, you may be enjoying a meditation, but not the same level. No. The reason is because Ajahn Brahm's mind is leaning automatically towards peace, whereas your mind is not. If you you are sitting there and you are thinking about things and you're fantasizing about things and you're worrying about the future, you're thinking about the past, all kinds of things are going through your mind, how to do your laundry when you get back home. <laughs> it sounds strange, but people have the weirdest things going through their mind yeah, if meditation isn't working out. And I remember there was this man on a retreat we had many years ago, and he said in his meditation, he was sitting and he had just put out his laundry and he was sitting, figuring out in his mind whether he should hang his shirt this way or that way, or back to front or which way around. This was what he was fantasizing about in his meditation practice, yeah? How to hang your laundry on the clothesline there. That's how, <laughs> that's what it gets like sometimes, yeah? It's kind of, it sounds crazy, yeah? It sounds completely nuts, but that is what the mind does, yeah? It gets involved in things. And why is that? It's because the mind is not leaning towards peace. Why isn't the mind leaning towards the peace? Because the mind does not understand where happiness is to be found. It looks for happiness in the wrong place. It looks for happiness in whatever, even in laundry, which you would think it wouldn't be very happy, but sometimes it is better than, than the alternative. Yeah? And that is why it doesn't work. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. But I, I said to this, uh, I can't remember whether it was a man or a woman who asked me this question, but I, I said to this person that um, 
but you know that that is my idea. Now go and ask Adam Brown. Then. And so they said, okay, sure, we'll ask Adam Brown. And so later on, they I'm not sure why they didn't ask Adam Brown straight away, but they kind of I guess they wanted to go via me. Maybe I feel less look less dangerous than Adam Brown. I'm not sure. But so they eventually went to uh, Ajahn Brahm and they asked him, and what Ajahn Brahm re replied is that, uh, well, when I sit back and I watch what I'm doing here, what I'm doing, I am inclining the mind towards renunciation, towards giving up. That was his answer. Yeah. And I thought that was a very interesting answer. First of all, you might ask, is that different from what I said, or is it the same? And you could argue that it is uh, two sides of the same kind, leaning towards peace, leaning towards renunciation are similar things. Yeah, it's a slightly different angle of the same idea, perhaps. Uh, but I think the idea of renunciation is more powerful in many ways. Uh, yeah. So what does that mean? Well, what it means, right, is that uh, Ajahn Brahm, again, he knows where happiness is to be discovered. He knows where happiness is to be found. And he knows where suffering is to be found. He knows that in that world outside, the world of busyness, the world of doing things, the world of problems, it just goes on forever and ever and ever. There is no real solution in that world. Yeah, and so for him, it is just like that. Yeah, you give up that world because it's not, there's nothing of interest in that world. That is what he means by inclining the mind towards renunciation, giving up the world outside, giving up the world of the five senses, giving up the world of the body, giving up the world even of doing inside of us because the doing and the craving that we have is very much tied up with the world outside. And then directing the mind towards the peace, towards the happiness, towards the joy, towards all of those things that, you know, are, that, that he knows this is where happiness is to be found. So one of the critical things then on this path of meditation is to be able to properly distinguish between happiness and suffering is to be able to understand the limits of the external world. Yeah, understand the limits of the five senses understand that everything outside of us is inherently unstable, unreliable. It's difficult enough to control our own body and our own mind. Yeah, our own mind is also out of, out of control to some extent. But the external world is far more out of control than our, our own minds. So uh, because it is so much out of control, and because after a while we realize that that world is just you know, who knows what's going to happen in that world? The country goes this way, then it comes back again, then you have COVID, then you have climate change, then things go better for a while, then they go worse again. It's just who knows what's going to happen in that world. And after a while, you get fed up because you start to realize that there are no final, complete solutions in that world. It is always going to let you down in one way or another. And after a while, you just get so fed up. You close your eyes and you go inside instead. And this is uh, one of those uh, fundamental things on the Buddhist path, that turning away from the sensory world uh, that allows you then to go inside and found the, find the peace within instead. Uh. So to enable you to do this in your meditation practice, uh, sometimes all you have to do during the meditation, yeah, if you start to feel that your mind is kind of leaning in the wrong direction, you are thinking too much, you're fantasizing about, you know, when you're eight priests, you're fantasizing about that dinner when you're going to come off this blooming retreat and I'm going to have a real proper dinner. Why am I keeping this eight precepts anyway? And, uh, and sometimes I have a bit of sympathy for lay people, yeah, who have to keep the eight precepts. I'm a monastic, Ben Bhutanda is a monastic. And after being a monastic for so many years, you don't think twice about dinner, it never even occurs to me the idea of dinner. But if you keep the eight precepts only occasionally, much more difficult, yeah? So you have my sympathy, but uh, see if you can make the most of that, uh, not, not think about dinner during the meditation, because really it just obviously destroys the whole meditation practice. So, but uh, in general, the point is just that remind yourself, uh, yeah, of the uh, 
problems in that world very gently, not in a harsh way, not in a way whereby you kind of reject everything as just all suffering and hopeless or whatever, because then you might get depressed and sad, but be gentle with yourself, be kind with yourself, but just try to remind yourself that that is not where real happiness is to be found. It is on the spiritual path we can find real happiness, real contentment, satisfaction, all of these kind of things, not in the world outside. And remember, one of the things that I have found sometimes is that when you start to become a little bit peaceful and quiet, and you can feel that the mind is like it powers up a little bit, more clarity, and you can feel that you are getting more ability to solve problems. Yeah, but now my mind feels really clear. Now I can solve all those problems I was supposed to solve. And it's very tempting to start solving all the problems in life. But remember that there are endless problems. Yeah. Next time you meditate, there's also going to be problems. The time after that, there's also going to be problems. And then there might be even more problems. Problems are endless in the world of the five senses. And the reason why we haven't gone further on the path is because we have been solving problems before. Yeah, Not only in this life, but in previous life. We've been solving all these problems all the time, never getting anywhere, and we're still stuck here. What good did it do to solve all those problems? Nothing. We're still here. Same dukkha, same problems that we always had. So forget those problems, yeah? Leave them aside. There is no solution there. There is no way of moving forward by just trying to solve all of those things. The only way forward is to let go of it and allow it to be. There's always just more of the same coming over the horizon. Again, don't make this thing into something depressive and sad. Don't make this into something which makes you feel bad about meditation or bad about everything. Uh, so not about meditation, about the, the world, uh, because then you're taking it too far. Make it something which kind of naturally makes you distance yourself a little bit from the world, yeah, and then go inside instead. Uh, do it gently, do it with wisdom, uh, so that it actually helps on the spiritual path. Do it gradually. The gradualness of this path is actually a very important part of it. Uh, and then as you do it in this way, it will start to give results. So it will start to enable you to let go of that. It's one of those great problems in meditation, yeah, is how to overcome the thinking mind. And I think this is really the answer. The answer to understand that those that thinking is almost always about the world. It's about things that are not really worthy a second, a second thought because there's nothing there to be found, nothing there of real interest. So now you can, uh, so this is, I think, really the kind of the critical thing that distinguishes a really super duper meditator like Ajahn Brahm from meditators who may be doing reasonably well or meditators are not doing well at all, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, uh, that is the main distinction, the ability to let go of that uh, sensory world outside. Uh, so uh, use these things uh, in your meditation. Don't use them in a drastic way. Use them in a gentle way, like little nudges that you use in meditation. It's like a perception that you uh, give rise to uh, while you meditate. You give rise to a perception and you kind of, um, okay, and then the mind automatically moves in the right way as you, as you do that. So this is uh, how to deal with uh, the restless mind and the thinking mind and the mind which goes out into the world outside. Um, there's one that maybe I should talk a little bit. I'll just talk a little bit more because uh, then we can do half an hour meditation at the very end. Uh, one of the other problems, of course, there's two kind of big problems that people find in meditation, but there's more than two, but there's two kind of big one and initial ones. Uh, one is the restless and thinking mind. Uh, and the other one is the tired mind. Yeah, you feel really tired and you want to fall asleep. You're about to go asleep and all of these kind of things. So, so I'll talk a little bit about the mind, which is tired as well, just to cover those two kind of main subjects. So, now, uh, there's two reasons why the mind is tired or the mind is lacking in energy. Yeah? And, and one of the reasons is simply because we have been doing too much. Yeah, the mind is tired because you have been at work or you've been looking after your family, you've been doing all kinds of stuff. And of course, the more we do, the less energy we have as a consequence. So one of the basic ideas then yeah, to overcome tiredness is just to allow the tiredness to be there. 
The tiredness has arisen in the first place because we have been using our minds too much. And if you try to use your mind more to overcome that tiredness, well, actually, it's going to make it worse. So the most important thing is just to allow the tiredness to be. Yeah, If you're tired, don't try to fight it, don't try to fix it up, but allow it to be, and then gradually the mind will emerge from that. Yeah, And then you can use little things like I was mentioning before, uh, maybe giving rise to a bit of joy or whatever as you move along. And the joy is one of the most powerful counteracting forces to the tired mind. Yeah? Because joy is energy. It's the opposite of being tired. So if you can find the joy there, guarantee you will overcome the tiredness. But first of all, all you really need to do is just to relax and allow things to be, and you will overcome these things as a consequence. Um, and uh, I know many examples of this. So people, uh, you know, people who are really, really good meditators who gain really profound meditation, and all of them say pretty much the same thing: is that you just have to relax. You just have to nod for a while. And if you don't nod, maybe you can nod off. Either just nodding or nodding off. You can add that off word if you like or not. But uh, yeah, depending on the circumstance. And then just allow gradually uh, through nodding or even falling asleep uh, that tiredness to overcome that. But the other reason why the mind is not fully energized uh, Tiredness comes on a broad spectrum, yeah? You can be tired in the sense that you are just really exhausted after a long day's work. Or it can also be a tiredness where you just don't have that full energy in the mind. Yeah, the energy is not really very strong. And uh, that, again, comes very often from the more basic problems of meditation. I talked about before about the problem of being too attached to the external world, the five senses, and, and the body and all of these kind of things, and how we need to uh, remove ourselves from that or uh, detach a little bit from that. And one of the things that you will find is that if you work on those on that first hindrance of the mind, the karma chanda, which is the desire for that world of the five senses, actually you will also overcome some of the lack of energy in the mind. Yeah, the lack of energy is because the mind is tired through contact with that world, through the desires and cravings that belong in that world. It's as if the mind is exhausted by always moving around this way and that way. And of course, then eventually the, the lack of energy will come as a consequence of that. And the more you withdraw from that world, the more you allow the mind to be still and peaceful, not engaging with that movement in that world all the time, you actually overcome tiredness in the long run. So you can see how all of these things are really interlinked. They're all really kind of almost the same thing. They're different angles on the same thing here. And as you overcome one of these hindrances, one of the defilements, you also overcome the other ones as well. And they kind of go together like that. So uh, for that reason, uh, you know, just uh, don't, I always say to people, don't worry too much about the restlessness and tiredness allow those to be yeah there's not much that can be done with that it is the first two of the five hindrances that are by far the most important ones so i already talked uh, quite a bit now about the uh, external world let me also talk a little bit about the second hindrance because uh, in many ways the second hindrance is perhaps even more important and that is the hindrance of ill will yeah via pada and obviously that is going to be a massive problem in your meditation. It leads to tiredness, restlessness, it leads to loss of energy, it leads to all kinds of negative things. So if you have, find yourself having a little bit of ill will, maybe as you start out the meditation, you're not really in a positive state of mind, don't start your meditation until you overcome the ill will. Yeah? This is one of those critical things again in meditation, is that to be able, uh, it's important to not meditate until the mind is ready. Don't go to the meditation object too quickly. If you go too fast when the object is not, when you're not ready for it, it will fail. Yeah, and one of those things to do is actually to ensure that you have no, no kind of negative thoughts inside of you, any kind of ill will, otherwise guaranteed that you will fail. So start off your meditation by uh, forgiveness, yeah? Try to find out where that ill will is coming from. Uh, remind yourself that, you know, uh, 
All people in the world are suffering and people in the world are largely carrying out their inner conditioning and even if they do bad things, they don't really know what they're doing, yeah, etc., etc. Use this kind of standard perceptions that we use to overcome the ill will. I will talk about this much more later on, but just as a very brief introduction, remember the power of forgiveness in meditation practice and do that at the very beginning to help you overcome anything which might be problematic. So uh, there you are. So that was a little bit of, of a rambling introduction for you, a little bit back and forth, uh, but uh, there is a kind of a number of points there I hope you can take with you into the meditation. So now let's do some meditation together. Let's try this out in practice, as they say. Now comes the real deal. So, okay. Okay, so as always, let's just start out with the very basics and make sure that you are comfortable, that you are at ease. It's only going to be a fairly short meditation, maybe half an hour or so. So just need to have the comfort of uh, for half an hour. So find that nice position where you are just right. Yeah, the body is at ease. Uh, there's no pains uh, in the body. Uh, and you can kind of just breathe easily. Yeah, there's no sense of obstruction or anything like that. Uh, but uh, initially, just allow yourself just to relax into your posture. The feeling, the mind, just being aware of what is going on uh, and allowing things to relax. And it can be useful in meditation to find a nice routine where you do things according to a certain system, perhaps. That, uh, you don't have to do things. <coughs> <coughs> you can do things uh, more quickly if you're already peaceful, but, but it's good to go through roughly the same steps every time. Uh, just to ensure that you are okay, that you are right, uh, and that you are ready to uh, go deeper in this on the spiritual path. Uh, so always to stay with the body for a while uh, to make sure that you are really at ease, uh, you're really feeling relaxed. Uh, take a few deep breaths if you have to, uh, and just allow yourself that time, allow yourself to be patient, uh, uh, to just allow things to calm down and relax and so you can enjoy the meditation practice.
and uh, always remember that in meditation it is patience that is the fastest way. Uh, there's nothing really that you have to do, there's nothing that you should control really, apart maybe from very gently nudging the mind occasionally. Uh, but really meditation is not to be done, uh, meditation is to be experienced instead. Uh, so your job is really just to stand back uh, to observe the process of calming happening uh, but it's not for you to get involved or to control uh, in fact the less you control uh, the more easier the meditation seems to happen uh, And uh, just try, if you can, to experience the delight of shutting out the world outside and how nice it is to move within uh, and leave that noisy world outside. Uh, noisy in the sense of so many things happening. Uh, let that go uh, and allow the mind to move towards the stillness inside instead. Uh, the more you can see the disturbance of the world outside and how it always agitates the mind and leads to problems at all times, the more you will incline towards inside. So please uh, make sure you notice that uh, and allow the mind uh, gradually to move in the right direction.
and uh, all the while during the meditation and make sure that you just go with the flow that you uh, observe rather than do uh, that you are part of the process never think of the goal uh, just be concerned about the process uh, and the goal will happen in due course uh, stay with what is happening now uh, just allow things to flow through you uh, and then very gently uh, if you can encourage your mind to see the beauty in the peace uh, see the power the delight uh, just allowing things to calm down uh, and become peaceful
Okay, everyone, so that's uh, it for now then. So uh, keep on going for a couple of hours. We'll see you back in two hours' time. Is that right, Madam Clara? Two hours? Yes, that's right, our champion yeah. money. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, please um, take leave, our jumbo Mali, if you wish. Um, I'll just say a couple of uh, practical things, which are just that we would suggest that if you wish to stay in the meeting, you could leave the meeting open and just turn off your video. Um, because there's only two hours between this meeting and the next. Um, but after the next meeting, we'll, we'll close it completely for the practice period this afternoon. So it's up to you really, um, but it just helps us a little bit if the meeting stays open and you stay in the meeting, then we don't have to, um, to allow you in again. You're already there. <laughs> of course, if you need to do other things, that's fine. But as you like. Okay, so... Shall we stop recording?